That's not really gin, is it? No, Damien, it's water. Good. That's the cold open. Yeah. <laughs> do, you want, do you want me to start acting really slurry? I think. <laughs> Oh no, I thought you were. (laughs) Tracy Harwood. Um, So I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat (laughs) feet. Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Oh, man. (laughs) Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima believe it or not as well as virtual production and other related technologies i'm here with my co-hosts tracy harwood and damian valentine and i'm phil rice hello uh, hello ricky is not here he is down at antarctica he left left his wallet there had to go back and pick it up so he should be back with us uh very shortly two different short films uh one is my pick for this month, and the other is Damien's. So I'm going to go ahead and use the bully pulpit of the host and choose my film first. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, and maybe the biggest is because Damien's pick is way better. Um, but I really enjoyed this. Um, this is GTA 5 Vigilante, episode one. And it's a it's interesting because the title would imply you know it, the title mentions two different video games right GTA 5 and uh, cyberpunk this is made in GTA 5 but it's made to look like cyberpunk and is that your understanding yeah, as well from the description thinking. you guys mm, yeah yeah okay which I think makes sense because the filmmaking tools that are in GTA V are frankly unparalleled in any other game platform. The built-in point and click and do stuff, it's amazing how powerful it is. And this this takes full advantage of that toolkit. Um, it, it couples it with uh, some very nice editing and kind of a nice sheen on the visual effects. Um, some very decent performances. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of whole there's not a whole lot of depth to this story. Frankly, part of it's because that's it's very short. Um, but it definitely has a a vibe that 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 goes well with the whole cyberpunk future city. Uh, type of thing and actually i i think in a weird way it kind of it blends those nicely because you know this is a crime story of sorts and and it's in the cyberpunk which i guess the cyberpunk main story is kind of a crime story too isn't it to, to yeah. some degree so anyway uh it's amazing to me that that uh gta 5 is still just such an astoundingly good platform i realize this this film is coming up on two years old now but still the game has been out for more than a decade uh it's amazing that that people are still using it and getting results like this out of it and a lot of that is because the modability and the toolkit built in for capturing footage and and manipulating it and changing it uh, again, just there's there's no more powerful machinima platform out there when you're in the realm of games. Um, and frankly, because the the world that games like this take place in is so large, uh, this work would be very challenging to it would be very very time consuming, very labor intensive to replicate 
in let's say Unreal Engine mm -hmm. um, or certainly with an iClone, but Unreal Engine's totally capable of this. We've seen stuff with this kind of scale, but it's a lot of work. Um, so in terms of expediency, uh, GTA Five is just it's it's really an amazing platform, and honestly, most I, I watch a fair bit of GTA Five Mission because I hope to stumble upon something like this, which has a at least some degree of maturity to the storytelling. Um, and honestly, it's a long, <laughs> disheartening search most of the time. Um, there. There's a lot of really visually pleasing looking stuff uh, that is just uninspired. Uh, this one, again, it's just a sense of maturity. And again, it's not the perfect story. It's not a complete story. It is just an episode, and I don't think that they've continued the shame. Um, but this person or team, I wish they had continued. Uh, because there's some real promise here. So, um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this, and I'm curious to well, see what um, you guys think. I was impressed that, like you, I, looked, I thought, is this going to be GTA? Was it Cyberpunk? Because I looked at the title. And then when I started watching it, I thought, okay, why didn't they make this a Cyberpunk? And then, I thought, of course, <laughs> GTA's got the better cinematic tools because Cyberpunk doesn't have any, apart from the ones that um, a model used because we watched the film about a year or so ago, right. made with Cyberpunk, uh, and they used some more t tools to do some of the camera. Um, I, I can't remember offhand. Uh, so, of course, it made sense, and also they've modded GTA 5 to get the Cyberpunk look. And if you look behind me, for those who are watching rather than just listening, this city is from Cyberpunk. Um, and what they've done in GTA 5 looks as good as the Cyberpunk game. And, Phil, you're right, this game is it's not a new game anymore but um when you're looking at the car there's like this car chase going through the in in this video in this film you've chosen and it looks just as good as driving around in cyberpunk i mean where the main difference is is when you look at the actual character models obviously the cyberpunk character models have progressed quite um more significantly than uh gta but as far as the cars and the city and you know the, the actual environment there's not a whole lot of difference so i can see why we're on top of the uh having just the camera tools and the, you know, the machinery tools why they would do that and obviously the video punk look and they've done it perfectly i mean it, you can tell it looks like cyberpunk and it, you know, it that's what it's meant to the story feels like something you'd expect in the cyberpunk world as well and they've modded the costumes so the jacket that the main character wears with the little bob bubble things on the shoulders that's straight out of the um the main cyberpunk game um that's one of the character the clothing options you can you can dress your character however you like and i recognize that jacket and it comes in very different many different colors um so they've brought that fashion style as well so it just kind of reinforces this is meant to be in the same world from a different game uh i thought it was really good i'm disappointed they never did an episode two because i that's the first thing i did just look to see what else they've done Me too. hoping to find episode two and it wasn't there and uh that's kind of disappointing i hope um the creator of this video will listen to our review and think well maybe we should get back to that because firstly i want to see more of yes it. um yeah uh yeah, I'm obviously a big fan of the Cyberpunk game, so you know, more stories in that world are quite an interesting thing for me. Um whether they're official or fan based, and this is obviously a fan based one and it's very intriguing, so please make more. <laughs> Let me um Tracy. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Now Cyberpunk teaser. This is based on or inspired by the Cyberpunk teaser release uh, and i was looking to see when that was and it turns out it was around 2013 ish 2013 so this guy whedon's innocent mm. was inspired to make this and, and had been putting this together presumably for quite some time um obviously made in in, in gta 5 and, it, and it, it, it kind of really combines 
cyberpunk with GTA 5 in a really interesting way because it's not GTA 5 and because it, it's kind of more than GTA 5, but it's less than cyberpunk. And I think that's a really, you know, how has he done that? He's kind of, the way he's created this is something that sits between these two worlds. So it's less than one and more than the other kind of thing. Um, and it's almost like what's being told here is the transitionary tale between these two worlds um, mm. embedded embedded in the culture yes. of both these worlds, which is, I mean, that's that's fascinating that he's managed to pull that off. Um, now, I really enjoyed the camera perspective on the car chase. I thought it was, you know, I mean, probably, Phil, you'd think it was a little bit jumpy, but I really liked the way it was sort of following the car on the ground and then spinning around. And, you know, I really I really liked the sense of movement that you got through the camera angle, which I thought was 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 really I, well I agree. Done. No, it was very well done. It was well done. But yeah. the other thing that I really liked was the way the story was told through the daydream. Um, and I'm assuming it's a daydream. Um, you know, this you've got the sort of sense of the floating body and the clouds and all of that sort of stuff. I'm assuming that's 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 reference to a daydream. Um, and that's basically how this main story is told. And it's told through flashbacks. Um, and you guys haven't mentioned the story at all. I, I really like the story. It kind of begins with this, uh, you know, this presumably a criminal escaping the police in this dramatic kind of car chase um, in order to deliver what appears to be some kind of package to someone who turns out to be a crime lord. Um, and there's this really interesting relationship between these two characters, the crime lord, the criminal, and it ultimately turns out to be oppressive and massively toxic. Uh, and you can kind of see the way that that unfolds. Um, I, I quite like the, the way that the, the female character was portrayed as beautiful and strong um, and strong in the sense that she also survives this brutal assault on her by this crime lord. That's a fascinating take on this, I think. I've rarely seen films that do that in, in, in the way that this is put across, put that female in that position. It's usually a male that you see put in that position. And it's, it's you know, you can clearly see that she's got some kind of relationship with, with this bloke. But you don't know what the nature of that relationship is, and it isn't fully revealed in this story. Um, maybe it's about uh, um, she owes him money, um, and maybe what's happening here is that um, he's not content with just a simple repayment of the debt, but has inculcated her into these kind of criminal activities. Um, and then you get a sense of why the car chase uh, took place, what the, you know, may, maybe the, the crime was committed at his, his behest and so on. So there's a little bit of ambiguity in what the what the, the story is in terms of why that car chase, what was going on with the meeting, and then why this brutal attack. It's kind of these, these interesting kind of components, if you like. Um, and really, the, that kind of brutal attack, I mean, it is brutal. It, you know, it's really hard to watch that bit where, where she's where she's attacked, mainly because you just don't expect that kind of thing to happen in the way it's portrayed. Um, and it's clearly her being defiant and him just, you know, uh, meeting out the ultimate revenge by, by, by trying to kill her. But she doesn't die. And instead, presumably she is rescued and... Presumably, she then becomes cyborg, and that's the transition into the cyberpunk world be because she survives the GTA world. Um, I don't know if that's exactly what he intended, but that's kind of the sense of what I got got from it. And, and obviously, you know, it's, it's it's badged as the first episode in that story. And I have to say, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed what was an unexpected twist on a, on a story. I thought it was sharp. I thought it was really well edited. 
I thought the scene selections were really interesting. I thought the dialogue was really well done. I thought the sound design was fascinating. I thought it was really polished. And it was, um, I, I think, just one thing that I thought, that doesn't feel quite right. And that's that scene where you've got that roadside contractor standing behind the wall and somehow he just looks a little bit kind of 2D-ish compared to the patina of the rest of what you see. So it just that one scene just jumped me out a little bit. Um, anyway, I, I enjoyed it so much. I thought I'm going to ask this guy where episode two is um, because, you know, clearly there was some kind of intention there. Um, but as it turns out, um, and this film was released over a year ago, uh, he has no plans at the moment um, to make episode two, um, which I, I think is such a pity because I think he made such a great job of this particular um, film. I'd love to see more, more of what he does with these with these characters. Um, so I thought it was a really great pick and thank you for um, sharing it. Did you hear any of that? <laughs> yeah. I just want to add that the car chase. Yeah, I did. All of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, I just want to add that the car chase was particularly well done. And I think we discussed before, sequences like that are incredibly hard to get right. Oh, so and, hard. Yeah. Uh, that's probably another reason why they didn't use Cyberpunk to make that, because you can have car chases in the game, especially now with the most recent updates. But trying to capture that while you're driving the car at the same time. That, that, I tried doing it in this, the photo mode for this just to get some screenshots of my car reaching around corridors and corners and you know, the tire tracks appearing and smoke going up in the air. And just doing that as a still image was hard enough. So trying to get a whole action sequence... I can see why they went with GTA Five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, masterful um, editing, mm -hmm. particularly yeah, that sequence. Absolutely. But overall, that was a big strength of this this short. But that car chase, serious wow factor there. Like, you know, it's it's very easy to for the audience to become disoriented if you don't choose your shots and sequence them correctly. Never a moment mm -hmm. that you feel lost in this. I mean, and that's that's master class level stuff. I mean, that's stuff that that there's many Hollywood directors that don't get that right, you know. And the result is this weird feeling of what exactly is going on here. Yeah, this is. I'm yeah. I'm intrigued, and I I wish he would uh, return to form. I hope that he changes his mind and does so. He or she. And hey. I I would love to know what his background is. He's uh, a because you know there's there's certain. It's a he. Okay. So there's certain there's certain skills that you can get from that are just intuitive. But this is craft. That that editing, that's training or practice or a combination of both. Uh remarkable. Really remarkable stuff. And and that's probably more than anything what pulled me to this. Other than also I liked the mature storytelling, you know, the the dialogue, nothing corny or out of place there. And like you mentioned, Tracy, it's a a serious and and at times gut wrenching uh, story uh, and sequence of events that that at the end you're like you're totally in this this the main character this female's you're in her corner right like it's like okay so she she made it um now what's she gonna do you know yes exactly. so. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful little pilot short. I hope we get to see more of it. Yeah. Yes. He's a professional, by okay. the way. Let's move on. We're trying to accommodate for, for pauses. He is? Okay. Yes. Yes, he's a he works for a game company. In what he's, capacity? He's a he he's he works for game I can't remember which game company. I did look it up. Um one based in the UK, and he is a professional content creator. Um, so he clearly knows what he's doing. So maybe uh, um, a similar type of role to what some of the uh, first and second gen machinimators that got peeled off by the gaming industry, they went but into, I don't know what their role was called, cinematography director or something like that. 
Very think maybe probably. he's involved in coordinating and editing sequences and cutscenes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's that's whew. what a job that would be. Amazing. Yeah. All right, Damien. You have a pick. It is called Flight. And for all the wow factor that the, the film we just talked about gave, this is truly a cut above. Uh, not, And I don't mean that to the detriment of the Vigilante film, but I mean, this is on a level uh, that is, we don't often see. I mean, this is, is truly stunning. Um, Flight, it's called Hyper-Realistic. CG sci-fi short using Unreal Engine. Um, tell us about it, Damien. Well, usually I start with an elaborate story about how I came across my pick. Uh, this just showed up on my YouTube recommendation. Nice. I looking for anything. <laughs> uh, but I was intrigued by the title, uh, especially the hyper-realistic CGI part. Because I thought, is that going to be one of those films that lives up to that title? Or they're hmm. just saying that to get clicks, and right. it lives up to that title. Um, so I watched it, and you know the first shot you got this the first shot of a human character. I thought that's got to be live action, and I'm pretty sure it is. And they've mixed in certain elements of live action footage with uh, machinima created with Unreal. Uh, there are some parts that obviously unreal simply because the cost of doing that live action and i'm talking specifically right. about the chase across tower bridge that's something that a big hollywood blockbuster would struggle to do uh simply because that is a major uh trans traffic um corridor across london so being able to lock that off to make an action movie uh for long enough to do a scene like this would be impossible so but when you look at the character, the the girl in it, she looks just as good there doing that stunt as she does in the apartment, and she looks so real. Uh, which is that point of, I can't tell which is real and what's not. Now, obviously, I'm pretty sure that first shot of the guy's face is a real person because there's just something about it that feels so well animated that it can't be animated. It has to be a real person. So I'm thinking maybe everything in that one room is live action and then everything else is unreal um now tracy i know you found the behind the scenes video for this and i have decided if i want to watch that or not because i quite <laughs> enjoyed the mystery <laughs> um but this whole sequence he's, he starts off he's washing the windows and he sees the girl in the window and she uh, uses her breath to make it a little bit misty and she writes help on it and i started thinking how do you even animate that with Unreal? Because you have to animate the texture and put that on the window, and he has to look real as her finger is drawing help, because it's not a case of the camera moves away and then looks back and it's there. Uh, it You actually see her doing it, and it's so perfectly lined up with her finger movements. Um, uh, and there's so many little details like that, that there's a huge, an incredible amount of work must have gone into animating this. Yeah. Um, and then he, he kind of goes in to help her and he kind of got this first person perspective as he, as he's walking in he's got a little the impression you get is he's got a little camera on his head or something because he's kind of remembering what he saw um but it does kind of cut to more traditional angles as well as you're um watching through it and i was just completely blown away with how much effort must have gone into this and it's a good little story but it's about 15 minutes long but you don't feel like it's 15 no minutes. It not at all by really quick yes uh and then when you get to the end the, there's a quite extensive credit section as well so it, it wasn't just one person making this there's a whole team uh, of people who worked on uh bringing this together so uh i just I, as soon as i saw it, i thought well that's my pick covered so uh what did you think you want me to go next? <laughs> uh, it's truly... Yeah, go ahead, Tracy. Oh, oh, okay, we've got uh, we've got a little bit of internet connection problem here. Um, all right, so you will not be surprised on uh, um, some of the stuff that I'm telling you. 
This is the directorial debut of Oscar winnings uh, VFX supervisor and Framestore's uh, chief creative officer, Tim Weber. Um, he's best known for his special effects on films such as Gravity, The Dark Knight, Harry Potter, and also on Avatar. Um, now, this film um, is a hybrid of a real life and unreal engine uh, creation. It's basically been done as a test that explores how to scale virtual production, uh, including VFX and real life performance for uh, shorts, but also for feature length films. And it's been done using something um, that Framestore have created which is a proprietary animation pipeline that they've called FUSE, which stands for Frame Store Unreal Shot Engine. Now, Flight, as I understand it, was released to festivals before it was uploaded to YouTube. And he has used in it what he describes as, um, as modern versions of the same techniques that were used in Gravity. And it was Gravity that he got his Oscar for. Um, so you can see... The, the investment um, in how this has been done. Um, I think it's really, it's kind of super interesting in terms of the story. Um, and it's it's kind of interesting to reflect on it. Um, uh, as I think really the context, um, well, it it's not massively different to Vigilante. So it's it's quite similar in in terms of this, sort of, you know, central relationship of of hmm. power and oppression between a man and a woman. And in this case, what you've got is a is a, a manager of this younger woman who appears to be something like an award winning kind of air border in this kind of futuristic city. And again, the this the city um is a little bit of a hybrid between I know it's. I know you kind of talk about it being London, but it's a little bit Los Santos ish, and a little bit cyberpunk ish. And I'm guessing most of it is probably the Matrix cityscape. I don't know, but I'm guessing that you know probably a lot of it is is drawn on that cityscape, maybe with a few added assets and a few tweaks to the atmosphere and the lighting and what have you. I'm guessing um, because I haven't actually watched the how he made it either. Um, now, what you've got this time is the central character has reached out to this passerby who tries to intervene and help. Uh, and in order to do that, he has to go, well, he has to find out where this girl has gone. So he uses a total recall like memory machine. Um, and I think what's interesting with this is that instead of going the meta human route with the characters, which most obviously do with um, Unreal, They've used real people and CGI instead. And I think that's probably fairly significant in the context of what we're seeing in terms of, well, what's this virtual production pipeline actually going to be? How do special effects fit into it? You know, how do we keep creators in the loop, so to speak? And I guess that's what he's trying to figure out with this new Fuse tool set. Um, now, of course, you know, because he's a professional, you've got, Absolutely great quality here. The edit and the presentation, of course, is, I mean, it's exemplary. It's what you would expect. Um, I think why it's interesting is because it's an example of a crossover between, you know, the, the filmmaking techniques, um, you know, professional filmmaking techniques, but also machinima techniques. And I and I we don't we don't often get to see the mid the mid-range stuff, but I think this is an example of the mid-range stuff. Um, in terms of the story, uh, and and if we're going to compare it to Vigilante, which I'd like to, um, I actually think Vigilante uh, had the more interesting story to tell because it had more of a unique twist on that central relationship. This is a bit of a tried and tested trope in this film. Um, Vigilante was a little bit unusual something that I hadn't really seen before that I can recall anyway. Um, so, yeah, I think those basically uh, are, are my kind of comments. I mean, the, I think it's a really interesting and creative way to approach um, storytelling. And I, and I guess why the storytelling is very similar is because, you know, similar to um, 
more traditional tropes is because where this guy's come from is is the professional industry and not the machinima world, which is where the other guys come from. Um, so I think I think it's a really interesting crossover pick um, that I'm really glad we got to talk about on the on the podcast. Um, Phil, I'm sure you've got more to say on it. Yeah, I mean, I I loved it. You know, it's it's. Uh, there's been a few different times in my machinima career, if you want to call it that, where you encounter a work that is on such another level <laughs> that it makes you kind of question, what are you even doing? Like, what business do I have putting my hat in the same ring as this? It's it's that good. And the funny thing is, is that the standard for reaching that has 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 raised over the years. I guess that's a good thing, right? The first, the, I think the first Machinima piece that did that to me was Hardly Working mm -hmm. by the Ill Clan in 1999 or 2000 when they released that. And they had completely retextured quake 2 and had these custom characters and they were puppeteering everything and i and i told paul marino this uh at some point later than that when we got to meet in person and i just says you almost made me quit completely i mean i said it kind of tongue in cheek but it was true like it was just that's just so much i, I don't even know how to do half of what they did you know at the time and I just thought, why am I even bothering? Um, and I don't know. That's that's a little bit of an immature reaction to seeing really good work. You know, uh, it's very immature, actually, um, because it should be a source of inspiration and it shouldn't be quite so. There's a level of competitiveness and. Oh, what's the. Zero sum game. I think that's the term I'm looking for. Where it's like there's only so much to go around. Uh, those attitudes had to be there for me to have that reaction instead of just being inspired and like, wow, and not totally caught up in the fact that, that, that this physical manifestation that I'm not the best in the universe at this particular thing, you know? What, what arrogance there is to even, you know, so I wrestle with that when I, when I watch something like this, it's like so inspiring. And at the same time, there's this, this kind of nasty voice in the back of my head that, uh, it's just my depressive nature, I think, but it's, it's this nasty voice that just says you will never be that effing good. Like no, there's nothing you could do about it. You will never be this good. Your stuff will never look that good. That's the demon I wrestle with. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's an absolutely amazing film. Uh, I'm going to try really hard to not completely quit Machinima after watching it. So thanks a lot, uh, you demon. Not quit because I don't want that guilt. Do I want to? I enjoy your work. I don't want to think you stop. No, no, no. Me. I don't want. I don't want that. But but thank you for saying that. But that's not what I'm fishing for. I know, um, but I'm just saying. I don't want But it's, it's because... a sense of this is just that good. It's it's a you know what the mature response to it is? It's to just say this film is humbling to watch. Mm. As a as a fellow creator, I am humbled by the talent that's behind this. And, and I that agree. should be okay. I should be a person who's okay with being humbled, you know? Phil, I agree with you on on one level, but what I'm saying is I actually think these guys have got a bit to learn from the machinima community too. Um, and, you know, if you just look at what the guys did with the uh, the Vigilante film that we um, talked about earlier, it, that's a different level altogether, you know, this, in terms of the story. Uh, and, you know, the people, people that are coming this from the industry side of things, yes, the quality's there. Yes, the tool's there. Yes, the way they thinking about it is there and the you know the editing and what have you but there's something that isn't there which is a machinima perspective and that to me is where the pros have got to learn from the indies so hang in
That's a great point. If Rick, if Ricky was here, he would, he would be trumpeting that. I think uh, because he's yeah. as someone who's had, uh, who has been fully in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, he'll be the first one to tell you that the the playbook used by Hollywood storytellers is right out of you know Robert McKee's book story. They all just use that. There's certain structures to stories. Then this arc, the three act structure, and this this is what you do. And there's only I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, you know, there's only there's only like six stories in the world. And everything is just one of these. There's the hero who does the, and it's just like, no, man, <laughs> no, that's just not correct. But there are there only six stories that make it through the Hollywood gauntlet. That I'll believe. Mm -hmm. That I think is maybe closer to true. But are there only six types of stories in the whole world? No, no, there's not. So yeah, that's a great point. And I don't, that's that's a good point, is I don't aspire to be someone who can tell a great story in the Hollywood template. I think my work reflects that, but I, I don't want that. But the fidelity of the production quality, I fully admit, I covet, covet what they're able to do here. Yeah. And and I, I the humbling part of it is, if I keep at this at this pace for the rest of my life will i even get there by then it's so good it's just so good so i either you know get rich and hire a team or i need to just learn to be happy with what i can do i think is what it comes down to so or wait uh, until i'm not saying that you is... need to be rich to make this but i'm saying that if you don't have the talent to do it yourself you yeah I was just going to say, you could hire a team of AIs <laughs> eventually. Oh, I, 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 write I, the I, screenplay. Me for and me. I, <laughs> me and I, me and I, 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 I. Yeah. Right, right. Anyway, amazing, amazing pick. Uh, it's, Damien, it's hard. It's hard to fully digest the fact that this is even in the same category as far as what went into production of this, it that it falls in the same category as the stuff that you and I do. That's yeah. a, that's a stunning thing because yeah, this is amazing. And now that you've mentioned it, Tracy, I am really curious about uh, what they did for the cityscape. If they used that unreal asset you were talking about. The Matrix uh, City. I actually tried to. <laughs> we'll close with this because uh, th this week, uh, Warlord over on Facebook uh, did a did a post talking about the challenge of running out of disk space for all the assets for productions that he works on and stuff. And Tom Jantel <laughs> chimed in on the thread, and I did as well. And because it is, it's a constant battle, and it's kind of a funny thing if you've been around long enough. The way that we as people in technology tend to think about these numbers and how we're always wrong of how much is enough, how much is enough memory, enough storage. And, uh, well, in that vein, I tried to, uh, after I did that unreal engine tutorial that we talked about in the news episode, I got really excited. And so I went to the marketplace and downloaded all the, all the freely available content that I could get my hands on. <laughs> um, not, I mean, I was selective, but it was a lot of stuff, right? Okay. And so I went ahead and triggered and downloaded all those. And one of them was the city. Uh, and yeah, I ran out of disk space before that one completed. Like it, my drive was filling up and I'm like, what? How many, how many gigs? <laughs> yeah. But I want to eventually, uh, I've already expanded my storage. So at some point I will be downloading that again. And I really want to get in there and, mm -hmm. and see it for myself because uh, it's a pretty... Pretty amazing resource, and I've got some ideas of something to do in it. But yeah, when you mentioned that, I thought, well, that would be a because clearly this this is not matte paintings or anything of that variety, right? And it's not green screens. It's not. It's there's something there's some real three D going on there. Yes. And yeah, I am curious uh, how they how they how they approach that. Mm -hmm. um, there's one shot where. Uh, 
something that looks a lot like London Bridge is in in view, and I didn't know that that was part of the the Matrix City. But you know what? It's I don't think it is. Frankly, if you if you've got a system that can load the Matrix City in there, then adding a custom adding a custom London Bridge is trivial compared to that. So yeah, they could have augmented it with their own personalized landmarks and things to give it a unique feel, which is very smart. Yeah. So anyway, wonderful pick, Damien. Thank you for doing it. Um, most of my talk about it being discouraging is, is tongue in cheek. Uh, I mean it as a compliment. This is, it's just as I've, as I've already said, it's just, it's really amazing and inspiring work. And uh, if, if I don't get all, narcissistic in my reaction it's not discouraging at all uh but you know i'm a work in progress so all right thanks for joining us uh i'm i'm sorry that ricky had to miss this particular pick uh the this this particular episode because he would have loved i think uh he, he would have found stuff to love in both these films so maybe we'll follow up with him later and ask him what he thought of them yeah um if you have feedback for us on either of these films or, uh, you know, just want to pipe in, tell us what you think, you can do that in the comments section of wherever you see this uh, podcast or video posted. Or you can drop us an email, talk at completelymachinima.com. And on behalf of myself and Tracy and Damien and Ricky in absentia, thanks for joining us and we will see you next Bye. time. Bye.